Everybody, I'm Dr. Oz. You're watching Better Together with Maria Menounes. Tune in. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to Better Together. When you know better, you get better. That's what we do here every single day. It is Tuesday, February 16th, 2021. Our quote of the day, you need to be proactive, carve out time in your schedule, and take responsibility for being the healthiest person you can be. No one else is going to do it for you. And that is from our guest today, the infamous Dr. Oz. Uh, I would say, be your own advocate, right? That's right. That's what we talk about here all the time. Today we are here uh, in our East Coast studio. We're going to be chatting with Dr. Oz, and he's going to give us the most up-to-date information about COVID. For any of you struggling with sleep, we're going to talk all about that as well, and, um, and so much more. So... I say we get right to it, Kelsey. Let's do it. We are going to have a chat portion at the end of this episode, so stay tuned. Stick around. We are going to talk about uh, Radical Remission, Ooh. one of my favorite books and very poignant right now as we are in the midst of a radical remission, I would like to say. I agree. Because we only believe in miracles here in this house. And uh, seeing where my mom was two weeks ago and where she is now no is kidding. radical if I could say. And so we'll chat all about that. And Kev, what else do we have lined up for the chat after? Maybe some picks. TV picks. Yes. Ooh. Our favorite TV picks for the day. Let's do this, guys. His show is a 10-time Daytime Emmy Award winner, and he is an eight-time New York Times bestselling author who's also been named Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People, Forbes Most Influential Celebrity, Esquire Magazine's 75 Most Influential People of the 21st Century, amongst so many accolades. The son of immigrants, he received his undergrad undergraduate degree from Harvard University and obtained a joint MD and MBA from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and Wharton Business School. He is a proud husband, father, and grandfather who has helped millions throughout the years with his medical advice, including yours truly and my mom, who we'll hear from in a moment. Better Together and the Heal Squad welcomes a person who truly cares and someone I consider a friend, Dr. Oz. Thank you so much for being with us today. God bless you for that kind introduction. The last major appearance that I made, which was almost a year ago, was with you <laughs> at, a, at a big event in Los Angeles. And how much the world has changed. I'm glad you look well. Thank you. I was thinking about that as well. We were co-hosting Tony Robbins' big birthday extravaganza. And who would have known that right after that, the whole world was shutting down. And now we're just all coming together through Zoom. Well, it's, it's accelerated the world. I mean, initially, I was really bummed. And then I began realizing that there's some opportunities if you're a dad because your kids have to come home. Mm -hmm. So they were forced to talk to me. And then more bummed because it's lasting longer than it's supposed to. And so I had the usual roller coaster ride that most of America had. But I think when, you, when it all is told, and, and I am optimistic we're going to come out of this over the next few months, um, most people look back and either lament or celebrate that the world jumped forward a decade. As is often said, you know, sometimes, you know, years pass when nothing happens and other times, you know, weeks pass when decades happen. Yeah, it's it's definitely a strange sensation that I'm still mm -hmm. wrestling with. We were talking about it yesterday where it's like, wait, I still can't believe that the world just stopped. Like the entire world. <laughs> like the, you couldn't make this shit up. <laughs> I mean, yeah, in horror movies, but we don't believe horror movies are going to come true. Now I'm going to start looking for Freddy Krueger to show up. Exactly. It's bananas. Well, I um, I will say uh, I had a lot of fun with you hosting Tony's birthday party, and we raised a lot of money, and that was uh, a really nice way to kind of shut down um, on that note, I guess, because, you know, that was the end of everything. Um my mom this morning was very excited because as you know, or as you may remember, you are her favorite. Um, I have been organizing this house and, uh, and finding notebooks of all the things she's learned on your show because she would write oh notes goodness. as she watched the TV show. <laughs> and so this morning, she was having a great day. Um, I don't know if you know, but both my parents got COVID uh, at Thanksgiving and yeah. it's, uh, it's heard. been a thing. And... She was having a great morning. I go, Mom, guess who's on the show today? She goes, Kevin told me, Dr. Oz. And I said, <laughs> yep. And so I shot a little video, actually. She says hello. So Kels is going to roll that in. That's right. Here she goes. And we are chatting about Dr. Oz being on the show today. Mom, 
Talk to Dr. Oz. Hi, Dr. Oz. Isn't he your favorite ever? Yes. <laughs> we went on and on, and I said, have you learned everything from him? She goes, not enough. I want more. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So um, we are big fans. And, uh, you know, as I said in the intro, you've helped millions of people over the years. Um, what does that feel like when you kind of look back and think, you know, you could have gone just the traditional route and been, you know, you're still making your rounds as a doctor in, in you know, your off television time. But when you look back and you say, wow, I was able to bring something different to TV and share so much with people. Well, if I'll tell you, it, the first time it really dawned on me, I, it was my last appearance on the Oprah show. And, and the Oprah show, it was a very buttoned up organization. You knew everything that was going to happen. Uh, they wouldn't script the answers, but you knew what was coming at you so you could prepare in your own mind. And the last show, she had no preparation for me, which drove me crazy because I said, what am I going to talk about the whole time? And she said, well, it's taken care of. Just be yourself. So I walk on the stage. She grabs me forcefully by my arms, twists me around. And on that Oprah stage, there was a huge monitor in the very back that she would put videos up and, you know, fun graphics. And it was a lot of little boxes of people who had written in saying that their lives had been changed by watching the show. And it really touched me because I realized that you actually have a lot more ability to communicate stuff that's profoundly important. But of all the things that I shared, it was the fundamental reality that you should be the world expert in your body. And if you are, you actually have a ton more control over the process than ever you could ever imagine. And I'll just give you one concrete example. I mean, ridiculously, I remember when I first started talking about quinoa 12 years ago, people wrote in saying, how do you spell it? <laughs> and it was reflective of na the naivete amongst some some people knew all about quinoa, but most Americans didn't get it. And the reason that they didn't get it is we never gave it to them. Mm -hmm. And so the real qu question for me was always, was I going to be brave enough to leave the ivory tower that I was working in where it's pretty comfortable, I'm protected, I'm, I'm at Columbia University, so I've got all these people around me that I love being with, you know, the money's good, the experience is better, um, and how can you beat that? Well, the only problem with that is we know a lot of things that people on the outside don't understand. And it's very difficult to explain it unless you you get completely out of your doctor headspace and you start to say to yourself, what is it that people need to hear and so they can actually act? Accessible information, news you can use. And that was the transition that Oprah, we used to joke, it was Oprah University. But that was her real art form. People you know, always talk about how good she is, this and that. What, her, what she's really good at is taking complicated ideas and making them accessible because if they're worth it, uh, then you need to hear it. Yeah, I I love that. I love the fact that you were the you know, you had to contemplate the move from the ivory tower into this because the truth is you're an open target. When you're on TV and you're sharing, there's going to be the detractors and the the haters and all of that and I definitely know that you had your share of of difficulties to to navigate and you know, especially as someone who also champions alternatives. Yeah. Right? Um, yep. that's, that's it's, not easy for a doctor. I, and I get it. And in some ways, medicine is like religion. If you've learned everything you needed to learn in medical school and you think you're a good doctor, and I start talking about things that are outside the orthodoxy of medicine, it has to be wrong, right? Because mm -hmm. I would have learned about it otherwise. But I was always touched by a professor I had at Penn in my early, the first week of medical school. And he, at the very front, it was like a paper chase scene, right? by the way. I became, I was president of my class too. So I was in the very back of the room just so I could sort of see what was going down. And this guy got up in the front, as arrogant as we all were as medical students, he got up in the very front of the room and he said, half of what you will learn in medical school will be proven wrong by the time you finish your careers. Oh. And then the question of course is, well, which half do I have to learn? Because that would save me a lot of time. But the deeper wow. reality is medicine changes so quickly, we have to adjust. Alternative medicine really to me was global medicine. You had globalization of finance, right? You get any money out in any currency anywhere in the world. We have globalization of media. You were watched all over the planet. Uh, and medicine should have followed along. It didn't. Medicine remained remarkably provincial. And so the ability of medicine to become global by taking traditions that have worked elsewhere, traditional Chinese medicine, uh, sub-Saharan medicine, Amazonian insights from herbs. By the way, we take, we choose and pick some of these ideas already. We use them in chemotherapy and malaria treatment, even HIV treatment, but we never actually adopted the whole uh, wisdom that 
much of this, if in the case of Chinese medicine, is 5,000 years old. And so it's foolish for us to ignore that mm -hmm. as an opportunity because guess what? People have had the same problems we've had for 5,000 years, learn from them. And here's the other part of it. Although they have not been studied in randomized trials and all the things we want to have for orthodox medicine to respect these approaches, if something really doesn't work, after 5,000 years, you know, probably people start to figure it out <laughs> and whittle it away. So it might also be that we just haven't gotten smart enough to prove that it works or exactly how it works, but there might still be some benefit. It's a great point. Or there isn't enough money in certain things because they're natural. They're, you yeah. know, it's not, it's not a, an easy thing to sell. Um, and I, I love that message because the journey that I've been on with my mom the last almost five years, by the way, mm -hmm. she's lived past four and a half years now with glioblastoma. Oh, it's unbelievable. And, it really means it's just incredible. And beat COVID, by the way. So <laughs> what I think, like what I've learned in this journey is exactly what you have been saying is you really have to be your own doctor. In this case, I was my mom's doctor. So she said the other day, she goes, Mario, we run around for doctors. I have one right here. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, mom, please don't inflate my ego. But but the truth is, I know my mom better than any doctor is going to know her because I'm with her 24-7. And, and the truth is, if you, you know, for me, it's a collaborative effort, right? Like you are well studied. You've seen a million of these cases. I take what you have. I use what I feel and what I see and what I know she'll do, what I know she won't do. And then mm -hmm. I kind of move from there. Um, but using your own gut is one of the most important parts of this. And not being afraid to try things in the right moments um, that maybe aren't the conventional ways. So I've used the conventional ways. And then when, you know, I was, I was in a situation, for example, where they said her tumor was growing, um, everyone had, I had a, created um, a, uh, a board of directors, let's say, for my mom's care. So I had mm -hmm. the top experts from all the institutions across the country, and I would send the MRIs to everybody, and what do you think? And this institution would say, operate immediately. The other institution would say, we need to put her on a vast, and we need to put her on this, we got to do that, and probably surgery. And everyone has something vastly different to say. That's when I realized, I don't think anybody really knows everyone's guessing. So now why can't I guess? <laughs> so I took her to Mexico. We put her on um, a super clean diet. We put her on marijuana. We um, upped her immune system with the high dose vitamin C drips and the turmeric drips. And we optimized her immune system. And from that moment on, her tumor only shrunk and did better and better and better. Well, when we hit our heads up against a wall again last year and our tumor came back, the first thing I did was rush them to Mexico, started the process again, but this time, because it was a little scarier, we took it a step further. I was like, okay, I'm okay with some of the lasers. I'm okay with some of these other things. And then we also did the conventional stuff in, in the hospital, right? So I married all of the different things and, and it's all worked because, well, also as Tony has taught us where focus goes, energy flows. So I'm focused yep. so deeply on her and keeping her alive and healthy um, I know that helps as well, but I think it's like you take the best of what doctors can offer and the best of your own gut and you marry the two. And I think that's when you have the most success. I suspect that a portion of America completely gets what you're saying. One of the big challenges for me and you is to democratize those insights mm -hmm. because there's still a large part of the population. I'd venture to say more than half who are intimidated by their own bodies or they think they're just ectoderms with soft little plasma on the inside, but they don't actually understand the subtleties of how the body works enough that they could actually feel comfortable getting into their own care. And I, I really think we're reaching a tipping point. When I first started doing my show, and I joked about not knowing how to spell quinoa, but the big issue was that people did not believe they could reverse chronic conditions with lifestyle changes. Mm -hmm. They really didn't understand that your diabetes can get better, maybe even to the point where you don't need medications if it's early, or your blood pressure can be managed effectively, again, with reduction of medications or cessation. Uh, and you could actually make these lifestyle changes without having to change every single working moment of your life. As people began to have those epiphanies, they began to say, well, you know, if I can have my, my insulin by to eating better, 
which by the way, doctors know, the reason we don't tell you is no one ever listens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yep. after a while, when I was having dinner the other night with a, with a colleague and he had those little inhalers of insulin that are out there now. And he was having wine and uh, tiramisu. And so I said, well, you know, you're a diabetic. How you can eat that stuff? He goes, watch. <sighs> Took a big bolus of his insulin and then he ate his chicken. His... So I said, that's not quite the same. I mean, the purpose of the insulin was not to allow you to have wine and tiramisu. And he says, for me, those are my life sustaining vices. I don't do anything else wrong but those two things. And so it was sort of an interesting balancing act he'd reached, but at least he was aware, self-aware of what was going down. I think it's those deeper insights that much of America doesn't have. And that is the salvation of our healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem with COVID, which I know we're going to talk about later on. Yep. And I don't know why we have not made a bigger deal about this. But if you look at people admitted to the hospital uh, who, in New York, for example, with complications of COVID that are, that are deadly, 90% of the time, they had at, at least one major risk factor, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, something big like that. 90% of the time, they had two of them. So basically what I'm saying is, unless you had two side effects, you probably weren't, go of these two of these chronic conditions, you probably weren't gonna end up in the hospital. And this has been now re reinforced in numerous studies around the world. And yet we're just, you know, we're laser focused on the next therapeutic, which we need that too, right? We need treatments of people in hospitals. But everyone right now can start taking better charge of their health and theoretically, because we can't prove it yet, but theoretically reduce the chance of ending up hospitalized if they get COVID-19. Well, let's talk about COVID because both of my parents, I know your mom um, got COVID as well. My parents got COVID. I have one severe type one diabetic at 76, my dad, mm. and my mom with stage four brain cancer, um, both got COVID. And I wonder if they're okay today because of a few things that we had done leading up to it. One, they both got their flu shots. Mm -hmm. Two, because my mom, I'm always on top of her. Um, she does these high dose, high dose vitamin C drips for the cancer monthly. Mm -hmm. I also get them the immune shots um, that have uh, a couple different things in it. I can't remember right now. <clears throat> but zinc's the, in there probably. The zincs, the glutathions, the B12s, all of those. Yeah. Um, and then we were at home doing the the vitamin Ds, the... Um, and the echinaceas and the garlics, all of that. So I wonder if, and I don't know if you've seen any research behind any of this, but if those things are are really working in preventative ways for people. Well, the, the, da the data is strongest around vitamin D, which seems to really impact mortality rates, even when given in the hospital, and is associated, not, we can't say it's causing it, but people who have high vitamin D levels just seem to go to the hospital less with COVID than people with low vitamin D levels. So that's for that question. There's been some data supporting zinc and some other data that doesn't support it. Personally, I take it. Mm -hmm. But if you get sick, you want to take a higher dose, ideally. Uh, and then there's you know, vitamin C where there's just not much data. But although I personally think it's you know, not going to hurt you and probably help you. Um, and a bunch of other things like selenium that might make sense. But those are all therapies that it can be achieved in part, not completely, but in part by diet. Now, vitamin D you have to take because you can't get vitamin D from your diet. I mean, mushroom is the best source. They don't have much. Is the it the D3? Is, D. is it D3 though? Yes. Yeah. It's D3. And so you have to convert it and make it. Vitamin D is a hormone. It's yeah. called a vitamin, but it's basically a hormone in the body. And when you get exposed to the sun, which I would definitely do for your parents as the weather warms up, mm -hmm. uh, it, you actually make probably 50 chemicals, not just vitamin D. You convert cholesterol to vitamin D, by the way, which is why in the winter time your cholesterol is higher Whoa. because there's, not, there's no sunlight to convert the cholesterol to vitamin D. And eighty percent of the population in the winter time in the northern latitudes is, is, is vitamin D deficient. We don't have any vitamin D getting into our bodies. Wow! And even in the southern hemisphere, you know, this, you know, this, the warm states, people put on so much slumbock that they never get exposure to the sun to make these chemicals. So, in any case, they're they're Whoa. they're. they're there are things we should do anyway to get these foods in our body. However, the more important point I'm getting at is that the foods we eat inflame us. Mm -hmm. Sugar and saturated fats in particular, when they inflame us, yes, we need antidotes to inflammation. But remember, most people who die of COVID don't die with the virus. Most people who die from COVID are free of the virus, but their immune system is waging a civil war that's hurting them in desperate ways. And that's why I think your parents and my mom did okay, because... I mean, I am meticulous with my mom and her Alzheimer's. She doesn't, you know, I've got great advice from Rudy Tanzi, Mark Hyman, others. Uh, we're real world-class people on Alzheimer's. 
So she eats a very carefully described, you know, crack, crafted diet with minimal inflammatory elements. So when she got COVID, I don't know how your parents dealt with this. My mom, my mom woke up one morning and she was out of it. We thought she'd had a stroke. Yeah. And so took her to the hospital. She's in Turkey. In Turkey, they don't give you a choice. There's a protocol. You get an antiviral, you get hydroxychloroquine, everybody, period. No, those don't, they, get, they put the pills in your mouth as you're there. And within 24 hours, she was better. Never had a problem again. Was, you know, stayed home. For, uh, and it was, they, they, by the way, they don't keep them in the hospital. They don't, I don't think they have the capability uh, of managing that many people in the hospital. But she went home and did great. Wow. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll say my dad, he got it. So first my mom got it. She was, they, I was on a plane and I landed to this, but they found her unresponsive, rushed her to the mm -hmm. hospital. And, um, and, you know, she did pretty well. Um, you know, it was, it was scary, obviously, because she also has the brain cancer. So she was, right. you know, she would fade away and she, she wasn't with me. So I started doing 24 hour FaceTimes with her. So mm -hmm. we, my husband built these stands with a magnet oh, on them. Gosh. God bless you. You married an angel. I did. So um, I brought it to the hospital. First of all, I fed the hospitals every day, like donuts and cookies and snacks and Thanksgiving dinners, whatever I could to show my appreciation. But also I was like, hey, can you put this in our room? <laughs> so um, I did 24-hour FaceTimes with her so I could manage her care and keep her brain activated and moving and talking. So I would get her to recite Greek poems or songs. And it, and Dr. Oz, sometimes it would take me two hours to get her to speak, but I was like working it. And I would put her in my car, on my iPad, wherever I was going, whatever I was doing, she was next to me. And so I know that helped. My dad got COVID and within 36 hours, it was like nothing happened. And then we yeah. screwed up and he was outside in the cold one night and it got into his lungs. And that's when he ended up having to go to the hospital um, and so, you know, unfortunately it went like that, but it's surprising to me because all you hear is if you have an underlying condition, that's it. So when my parents were diagnosed, my heart sank into my stomach, um, mm. as yours, I'm sure did with your mom with Alzheimer's and especially at her age too, but it's, it's a nice example to show people that, you know, it doesn't always end like that. Most of the time it ends much better than we had feared. Um, and that's, I think, one of the issues that's, a, that's playing America now. We have so much fear and anxiety around the, the way we interpret the world around us. And for, for many people, they've lost agency over their future. They don't think they control their destiny. And if you want to cre <laughs> create a crisis for a rat in a maze, put them in the maze and then shock them unpredictably and don't give them any control over it. That's, that is a kind of stress that leads to real disease. If you have the ability to avoid the pain or to work the maze to get out of, uh, of what you're facing, you actually don't have problems. I think it's metaphorically what's happening with us. You know, if we don't think that we, we, that we are, are in control and we don't like what's happening, then we just end up with this incredibly depleted, uh, not just energy level, but hormone status that predisposes us to all kinds of problems. And that is America's epidemic. You know, I did a, a video last week. I, it took me 30 seconds. I said, hey, I got a little hack, guys. I did it for TikTok. I walked over the freezer, grabbed a piece of ice, said, when, when I'm stressed out, I just get some ice, I hold it in my hand, and I just think about it. And that cold sensation distracts me from, it takes me out of my mind so to, into a true, a real, because ice in your hand is a real sensation. Something's mm -hmm. really happening there, right? You can, you can pinch yourself, you can make fists, whatever. A real physical sensation that's out of my head, and it's incredibly effective for me. I mean, it, was, it went viral. Now, that doesn't seem like rocket science to me. I sort of did it as a favor to a few people who might actually enjoy the tip. I had no idea that there would be an aggressive desire for the simplest basic rudimentary tools to escape from that loud noise in everyone's head. And you and I have spoken often about transcendental meditation and mm -hmm. the, the power and the ability for the human mind to get out of itself, get out of its own way. I think we have forgotten some of the archetypes that have defined human history. So where, where, where your family is from, which is right next door where my family is from in Turkey, um, is, is the birthplace of, of religion. So in southern, in southern Turkey, after southeastern Turkey, is a place called Göbek Tepe, which be, translates to Potbelly Hill. And it's the first place on the, on the planet, that, oh, this, it's the earliest evidence of human civilization. And they have these 17 foot high T-shaped stone pillars that are basically temples that these people used 
back then to celebrate that there was something beyond them. Now, interestingly, Maria, I don't know if you learned this in school, but I was taught in school that you, that humans developed agriculture. And then because we had some free time, a few people went off and made religions. And, and that's the, you know, that's how the species evolved. These people were not agricultural. They were hunters. And their ability to celebrate something beyond them gave them confidence they could work together. It made them realize that they were the safety net for each other, just like we are now. Mm. Because of that, they began domesticating animals and planting crops. The, the audacious idea you could control your environment, that you could actually make it so that's always a crop ready for your children, or you could have uh, uh, trained animals that you give you milk. This was a foreign concept back then, but it all came because they were able to create a cosmology a, a, and have these archetypes of things that are really important for them. And I think in modern day America, we forget those fundamental realities uh, that, that our ancestors have known for 12,000 years. And, and this, this crisis we're going through is a call not to go to church, although you could definitely do that as well, but to take a step back and think what, what's really going down here and what is it that for 12,000 years floated our boat that we need to get back to? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I think we forget and we give our power away very quickly. Um, what is your opinion on the vaccines? I, 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 I got vaccinated, uh, took both my shots. I had no problems. Uh, I think the vaccine makes a lot of sense. However, I've been working a lot with different groups, especially black Americans, who there's a lot of resistance. And so I understand and respect why people are hesitant to get vaccinated. Plus, there's all kinds of rumors about concerns about fertility, which I don't think are significant, but uh, they're, they're, they're out there anyway. And so young people are going to be resistant because they don't think the virus can hurt them that badly anyway. And so that's the, di the, di the dilemma we're in. Part of the complicating factor is the government has not had enough data to give us assuredness that it's going to change our lives if we get vaccinated. And so what I've been lobbying for is some evidence that you're going to do better in life, go to work better, or not have to socially distance, not wear a mask. What's going to happen if we get vaccinated? And so the first time, just for the first time this week, the CDC is saying you don't have to quarantine if you've been vaccinated. Because of course, if, if I was exposed to somebody and I'm vaccinated, it's less chance that I'll get infected, hopefully, but definitely less chance I'll have a bad complication from it. And so using that as evidence, their CDC is starting to support some of these moves. I think what we're gonna move towards is that if people have been vaccinated, they can take their masks off when they're with each other. Mm. And in order to protect people who have not been vaccinated, we'll avoid doing that around those folks. But eventually, especially as the weather gets warmer, yep. I think you'll get that. The other big issue, Maria, I wanna point out, is we really haven't had a very rational approach to people who've already had COVID. So your parents, should they get the vaccine or not? That's my question. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I got to say, I don't think I'd vaccinate them right now because they've only had the virus a few months ago. They almost certainly have antibodies left. They definitely have immune system reactivity that's been created by the virus infection. Um, and so they could, they're protected for a while anyway. And giving them additional vaccinations may not be the best move but if we're going to do it, I don't know if you need to do it now. Now, France, interestingly, says if you've had COVID-19, consider that one of your shots. Take the second shot. Wow. And so that'll allow you to get the second booster shot that will really build up long-term protection. Um, and they think that'll be beneficial. Unstudied. We don't know for sure. But we, I, we're going to have to make some decisions as a country because it's going to take us too long to get vaccinated. If every time you get the first one, they put your second shot in the freezer and store it for three weeks. That's not smart. We should be giving everyone a shot as much as possible. And if you got to wait for your second shot a little bit, it's okay. Yeah, that's, it's funny. That's, that was my next question on the vaccines because the fact that my parents already have it or had it, um, my concern is, and especially in such a close timing, what if I activate something inside of them again with this vaccine? Well, anecdotally, uh, that's the fear. Because right? yeah. we've seen people who have, especially if you get a, if you get COVID between the first and second shots, because that now you've had three shots basically, right? Mm -hmm. You have COVID, the vaccine, then you have real COVID. That's like equivalent of a, of a vaccine, another shot. And then you have a third, you know, exposure with the second vaccine. And so that can, that can lead to overstimulation of the immune response. So it's, I think it's especially important to avoid getting COVID between the two shots because then you're never, never land. Yeah. So do you suggest for people who recently had COVID to get the antibodies test to see if they still have the antibodies and then if they don't have them, perhaps going for the vaccine? I don't because I think it's a logistical headache and we mm -hmm. don't want to complicate the process anymore. Uh, if you think you had COVID, you should check your antibodies. 
And if you did, then maybe you stall for a while and let it, someone else go first, which is not a bad idea anyway. Yeah. And if you have don't no, any if you have no no I no belief that you've had COVID, just go get the shot. But there are many people, 25 million, who had COVID, know they had COVID, and there's at least that many more, probably two or three times more that actually have had COVID and they never couldn't get tested back in March and April and this is all going down. Mm-hmm. And those folks they should think twice. I, and we don't have any guidance from the CDC except to say, go get it. But yeah. it does sort of make me think, well, if the French are okay with one shot, at least we should study that as a possibility. It would also allow more people to get vaccinated. Yeah, I like that. I never thought about it like that. Um, how has COVID affected what you do every day? Well, I make a show on health. So it's certainly increased viewership. Um, it's made what we talk about more relevant. Those are unfortunate self-serving benefits of this. I'd rather not have COVID and have an audience in my, you know, in my studio and go back to life the way it was. Um, I think COVID has also challenged the establishment in America in ways they never expected. A lot of my viewers are hesitant to trust what they're hearing from wisdom, mm-hmm. you know, gurus and you know, learned folks because that it keeps changing, right? People that hear don't wear masks, wear masks, wear two masks. And that's a reflection of the fact that science changes and you've got to keep updating. But the, the drinking from a fire hose of information, which in politics you can do because it's like a soap opera, right? He's, do, he's doing that. They're doing this. I mean, that, it's fine. But in medicine, it's different because we assume medicine is solid and concrete or won't change. It's not, by the way. Medicine is always changing, but this is on you know, warp drive changing. Mm-hmm. And, and it's very difficult. It's dizzying for the average person to keep up. And the journalists often do a disservice by glomming onto the one novel idea, which I get completely because I would do it too. But you glom onto the one novel idea like there's a new virus strain. It's going to be horrible mm-hmm. without putting it in the context that, you know, I mean, I, this is actually a real issue that there, there's a concern right now that these virus strains are, are going to be a huge catastrophe for the vaccines. But the vaccines, their real goal is to prevent you from dying from the virus, not to prevent you from getting it. Hmm. We don't even know how effective they are at preventing the virus from getting you anyway. It's more that you don't seem to have complications. I mean, two weeks after the getting the second vaccine in the, in the Pfizer trial, the 44,000 person trial, there was almost no more disease of any meaningful venture. No one died. Wow. I mean, it's like stunning. <laughs> so that, that's a massive, massive improvement over the natural history of this virus. And so <laughs> if we can understand that and realize that's the real goal, I mean, yeah, if I get infected more often with this South African strain, I'm bummed, but it's not like I'm ending up in the hospital on a ventilator, which is the bigger fear we have. Yeah, because the, the COVID vaccine will also help with that strand. <clears throat> the COVID vaccine definitely helps with the UK variant. We're not 100% sure because it hasn't been tested with the Brazilian and South African, but there's going to be some benefit. And it's very easy to retool these mRNA vaccines to make a booster if we needed it, but I don't think I'm not sure we need it yet. Mm-hmm. That stated, you're dr- you're you're introducing a cloud into the previously clear vision that a lot of people had about the vaccine. So they start thinking, well, maybe I'll delay the vaccine until they figure out how to protect against these new variants. That's a mistake because there's going to be more variants after the current variants. You'll never catch up. There's seven more variants in America as of this morning that we never knew about just because we're finally testing to look for them. And so let's just focus on things that matter. Let's triage away the stuff that is sort of side issues, unimportant. I make this argument about health acts. You know, it's like the 80-20 rule. 20% of what you do drives 80% of your health. The other 80% of things you do to be healthy, if you have the luxury of being able to afford at the time to do it, et cetera, it's nice to do. Yeah, fine, do it. But that's not going to be the main reason you live to age 100. It's that 20% of things that everyone knows their mother told them were important. Wow. So when you think about pre-COVID, I mean, I remember Bill Gates talking about all these things that were coming and it just sounded like things that, you know, were never really going to happen, but here we are. Um, Are there any other ones that you see that are going to be an issue? Well, we're going to have more COVID-19s. They're going to be different strains of different viruses as they have always been. You know, Bill Gates, people blame him for knowing that this was going to happen. But what he did was look at what has been going on for the last 20 years, I mean, earlier too, but definitely over the last 20 years. Every three years, there's some new outbreak. That's scary. And Asia got hit hard by these in the past. That's why they were prepared this time around. They didn't want to, and those were, those were trial runs. I hate to say it, but COVID-19 might be a trial run for us. 
Oof. This virus is not nearly as deadly as it could have been. And if it was to be introduced in the future in another variant, and that's deadlier than what we have now, that will be a major issue. But we're better. Now we, have, we can make a vaccine in no time at all. Uh, we can be smarter about social distancing. We understand the mask science a bit better. Buildings are getting better ventilation. Uh, you know, we're, we're actually, schools are being improved. So we actually are better equipped to understand how infections go. And I'll give you one side benefit. You mentioned your parents had a flu vaccine. Mm -hmm. the, the incidence of the flu is nil right now in America because the flu travels the same way the COVID virus does. It needs to be aerosolized or through your sputum. Well, <laughs> I mean, as strong as COVID is, flu is weak. It can't do anything. It's completely nullified. Isn't that amazing? I mean, there are silver linings always to everything if you really look for them. Even with my dad in, uh, in the hospital, I was holding off not giving him the remdesivir because he was like just on the border, right? His oxygen levels were just a little low. And I'm like, no, we're almost there. We're almost there. He was almost released. And in anticipation of them wanting to give him remdesivir, they took him off his cholesterol medicine. So before he was admitted, for the last year, we've been dealing with this random elevated liver level situation that we didn't yeah. understand the root of. And so they took him off the cholesterol medicine. His liver levels improved, got back to normal. And then when it came down to, okay, we only have a two-day window left to give him the remdesivir, I was yeah. like, okay, you can give it to him. We can, we can do it. And, um, and so now his liver is fine again. Thank God. But we would have never known, perhaps if he didn't get into this situation. So you always have to look for the silver lining um, in all of this. Um, I want to get to sleep because I know sleep is a, is a very important topic to you. And it is to us too. I'm not sleeping well. <laughs> my husband's not sleeping well. Um, Winnie right here, my poodle, she's sleeping great, but we aren't sleeping well. So let's talk about the causes of, of sleep deprivation or, or sleep issues at night. Well, sleep is a single most underappreciated health problem in America. It is a catastrophe for a lot of people. Your mortality rate dramatically increases if you're not getting five to six hours minimum a night. Ideally, you should get more like seven to eight hours. And I think a lot of people have overlooked the fact that your immune system regenerates when you sleep. Your brain is able to lay down uh, better memories. It actually cleanses the toxins out of your brain. The brain cells shrink a little when you sleep so they can get washed out better. All of this, by the way, recently discovered as insights that make us believe they can reduce the chance, at least of symptomatic Alzheimer's. These are you know, pretty profound impacts of something wow. as basic as sleep. But Maria, think about this. It, there's no evolutionary benefit of sleeping. Right, I mean, you're you're not a, you're not able to protect yourself for eight hours. You know, anything can eat you: snakes, tigers, lions, bears. Right? There's no reason for us to sleep uh, on the surface. However, there must be, or we would have gotten rid of it, because there's no you know, there's no reason why the body would have preserved something that's so clearly maladaptive as sleep, unless it was vital to our well being. So now that you acknowledge it is important, what do we do to fix it? And unfortunately, people are nihilistic about it. They don't think they can change their sleep. They just stare at the ceiling all night long angry that life has cursed them with insomnia. And there are a lot of different ways of improving it. Sleep hygiene works, which is basically turn the temperature down in the room, wear loose clothing or no clothing, even better. Um, and do your best to make sure that you're not, the noise is dealt with. Beds make a big difference. I know you were kind enough to ask about this because I, for the first time, launched a line of products called Dr. Oz Good Life, mm -hmm. which is our, we, we work with the biggest seller on Amazon. And these guys are real pros. They're based out in Utah. And uh, they have always been willing to do clinical trials to prove that what we're doing makes a difference. So we made adjustable frames. That, 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 by that, I mean, you can actually lift the head of the bed up when you're sleeping. The reason that matters is that a lot of people don't sleep because they're snoring or they're having oh. issues with just bringing air in or they're uncomfortable in a flat bed. We're not supposed to sleep completely flat. And so by elevating the head of your bed uh, with these adjustable frames, we reduce the incidence of, of snoring dramatically. And that benefits the person next to you as well. And you. <laughs> <Exactly>. He snores. <laughs> so, <laughs> I Sorry, think honey. it's a wise move. And so we actually got one at home. Lisa, it helps us tremendously deal with those kinds of issues. I if you don't have a, a frame, just put two blocks under the bed board, the, he the headboard of your bed. Just elevate the mattress ever so slightly to let gravity drive, for example, gastric juices down, not up. Otherwise, you get reflux. All these things keep people up. I didn't realize that you're not supposed to sleep flat. No, we, we'd always have something that, first of all, we slept in trees, you know, primitively. But 
We're supposed to have a, a little bit of an angulation. Most people sleep better on their sides. Yeah. If they can put a pillow between their legs. Uh-huh. But if you don't have a pillow between your legs, your knees cross and they actually cause pain. So the other way of doing it is to, if you elevate the head of the bed a little bit and your knees a little bit, like if you're getting a massage, that's the best position to sleep in. These adjustable frame beds are very affordable now. They, they, they used to be super expensive, which is why people didn't know about them. But now th- the average American's buying them. And it, it improves about 20 minutes of more sleep a day, which is a lot more than most other interventions will give you. And those are the kinds of benefits you want to harvest if you can. But I don't like to recommend pills for people uh, to sleep because sleeping pills are designed for short-term use. So use them if you're in a crisis, a couple weeks. But I don't, if you've been on sleeping pills for six months, I worry that you've gotten addicted to them. What about CBD gummies? CBD probably works. Yeah. It's anecdotal. It's not been studied in a way that I'm comfortable with. But uh, CBD or even CBD with a little bit of THC mm-hmm. uh, probably does calm people enough that they sleep better. Alcohol, unfortunately, doesn't really. Alcohol messes with your sleep patterns. So you end up falling asleep because you're a little bit drunk. But then yeah. you wake up two hours later and you just... Mm-hmm. The structure of the sleep is not normal. What about yeah. melatonin? Are we mad at melatonin? No, melatonin I like, but you got to use melatonin in the right dose. Melatonin is a circadian rhythm hormone. It's not a sleep pill. Hmm. So it just tells your body it's nighttime. It mimics what happens when you see the sun set at night. And about a half an hour later, you'll start getting tired because those orange rays turn on your pineal gland to make melatonin. So you should take a small dose, half a milligram, maybe a milligram. You don't need 10 milligrams of melatonin. Hmm. So back to the bed frame, so I understand this correctly. If you don't have the beds that you are are um, now manufacturing, which um, you can go, we'll, we'll put the links to everything in the summary of this episode. Dr. Oz, sleep.com. Yeah. So you would actually put blocks under the two posts that have your headboard to elevate exactly. it so your bed just slants. Exactly. Because if you try to sleep on pillows, you roll off the pillows. Yeah. And so you end up on a bed anyway, but if the bed's flat, you can't change it. If you elevate the head of the bed four inches, for example, you'll create a little bit of an angle to the bed. So at least for things like reflux, you'll benefit because gravity will push the acid down your stomach, not allow it to go back up your esophagus when you relax your your intestines as you fall asleep. What about adjustable beds where the head can go up? That's what that's what we're making. Those are adjustable frames. Adjustable beds do that exactly. They used to be hospital beds, right? Yeah. We use those hospitals, but they're not very, they don't look good. So we make frames that fit inside your current box frame. The, the, the current, the device, that whatever you're sleeping on, our frames fit inside of that. We have mattresses and other things too, but if you just want the frame, Got you can it. take your mattress, put it on our frame, and it will move. In fact, it's got an automatic anti snore spot, so it'll find the spot to put you in to get rid of your snoring as you're falling asleep so your partner can finally get some some shut eye. Hey, now, sorry to out you, honey, but it's for the world's betterment. Um, what about Boys. sheets? It, is, are sheets an important part of sleeping? Yeah, the sheets, sheets need to keep you cool. Um, they need to feel comfortable on your body. Some people like chamois sheets, some linen, some satin. So with, there, there are lots of different sheep, sheet options. You, this is all about personal preference though, except for the fact that when you're cold, you sleep better. Mm-hmm. Your body wants to hibernate. One little pro tip, wear socks. Because if you put socks on, your feet will stay warm, which will let the body get cold. Mm. And as your core temperature drops, if you keep your temperature in the room 65, 68 degrees in that range, you'll sleep better. Okay. I like that. I love sleeping in socks. It's the best. So I'm right there with you on that. Honey, do you have any sleep questions for Dr. Oz while we're on sleep here? Hey, Dr. Oz, I'm too busy taking notes. (laughs) Sorry. <laughs> this is all amazing. Yeah, this all makes such sense. You know, dur- during the Revolutionary War period, they all slept with their heads up, you know, for better th- Wasn't that because of uh, influenza or whatever it was, the plague back then? Did you know that, Dr. Oz? They all slept uh, in the Did position know you're that. saying. Yeah. If you go, that's, that's, yeah. Honey, you know so many things I didn't know. I'm going to look it up. Yeah. Well, you know, you, by the way, I, you know, I could have used that in Jeopardy. I just hosted Jeopardy. Did you know that last did week? Did you? Yes, oh, I hosted Jeopardy. So I was looking for these kinds of trivia questions that these brainiacs figure out. So I could have used it. Where were you when I needed clothes? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Kevin with his random history information. I'm just geeking out about hosting Jeopardy. That's a I hard know. job. That's it's so pretty cool. amazing. You gain new respect for Alex Trebek when you do that job. It's like drinking from a fire hose. I'm I sure. Mean, these, are, these are 61 questions, rapid fire. You've got to ask them correctly. And then you have to, more importantly, get the answers right. So because... 
if they say something is a little bit off, you got to judge if it's right or not. Wow. And thankfully, they're pros. I mean, you do a, a boot camp where they really work on you to figure out, you know, the, the nuances that Alex figured, you know, honed over decades of doing the show. It's amazing. He's an amazing guy. Um, any other questions? I know Stephen had it one um, had one, I think, for sleep. Stephen, do you, I have a quick sleep one, Doctor Oz? Do you have anything that you recommend, like a ritual or something before bed that's really beneficial? Yes. Move the phone away because actually the phones are supposed to be five feet from your head. You're not mm. supposed to sleep right next to them. Uh, make sure that, that the room is, that you, for the last 15, 20 minutes before you go to bed, you read a book, but don't look at a screen mm. because that, those lights, the UV lights, the, the blue lights, I should say, from the screen will keep you awake. It'll turn off melatonin secretion. Uh, and then I like to either write some things that I've got. I've got a piece of paper next to my bed. I can write down things that are bothering me so I can deal with them in the morning because I can't deal with them while I'm sleeping. Mm. And this is really important. Do not check your email right before you go to bed. There's no good news coming to you at 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> <laughs> Let it go and get it the next morning. Listen, I love you guys. I got to go it's back to great... the top line here. Make some more shows. I love Thank it. you, Dr. Oz. Dr. Oz, wait, wait, one last question. Is there any way to do artificial light? Is there anything yes, out there? They exist. They have LED lights that are, that they, they take out the, the very, uh, the blue light. They only leave the red lights, but they look white. So these are LED lights that are widely available now. And I have only those in my bedroom. And wow. you actually really can't tell that they're lacking the, the blue spectrum light, but your brain sees yellow and orange and colors that are conducive to sleep. Wow. Fantastic. So guys, I uh, know so much more. Thanks to Dr. Oz. Um, I really loved hearing his thoughts on the vaccines because it's definitely something I've been wondering about. And I've just been kind of chill about it because I do know my parents have antibodies, I'm assuming. Obviously, that's, I think, a healthy assumption, as he said. Mm -hmm. But it just didn't feel right to me to vaccinate them. And so I'm glad to hear from him that that's how he felt too. Um, And I'm also glad to hear, you know, even the studies with the Pfizer, you know, the 40-something thousand people that got it. and and um, I'm off the he, fence now. From, I know. From I, talking to him, I'm ready. I am too. I am too. I'm ready to go, yeah. I'm, I'm ready too. to go get shot up. Yeah, I agree. I actually have, like... Too I, bad it's not available for us. <laughs> Ray, can you make what? a few calls? Honey, you're almost old enough to I'm, get it. <laughs> yeah, I'm a senior citizen. Why am I not allowed to? You're not a senior citizen. No, but I agree. I think I started, like, heck no... And then now I'm kind of like, all right. And my parents both got it. Um, My mom, the second one really affected her and she was like really sick, but was okay. And now that I see she's okay, I'm like, all right. And I don't know. He just, he really like, I watched a video um, of his earlier this morning and it freaked me out talking about all the like different um, strains. But when he talked about it, it actually really eased my mind. I was Mm. like, oh, yeah. Well, it's almost like. Because as he said, like with the news, it's like all fear mongering. Right. And so if we can all just take a step back, this stuff's all been, you know, we've always we, had issues. We're just amplifying them for news ratings no, and, and coverage. And, we, and, and we've also been so spoiled in this country for so long, you know. And look at, like, do you remember traveling and seeing pe- Asian people with masks on? They'd be like, yeah. Huh, yeah. what's that about? But like he said, they were preparing. And he was saying Gates, you know, which I've heard, like I'm sure Stephen has tons of conspiracy theories about the Bill Gates thing, but he was saying how Gates just was anticip- business's anticipation. He was anticipating this, seeing what was going on in the world. And what's really frightening is that th- we, he, like he said, this, this could just be, be our tr- test run. This just could be a trial run. That but, was crazy. But the good news is, is now we're prepared. Yeah. yeah. Right? Like the Chinese and the other cultures were more prepared for this. We were never prepared. We were just, we That's were just, true. We were just knocked in the stomach. And you know what I mean? Now... It's like, okay, we're sanitizing, we're wearing masks. Like, mm-hmm. I think we're more ready for these, for mm-hmm. the next ones to come. Although I definitely was like, what, this morning? <laughs> Let's not even go there. Let's not even <laughs> let our brains go there. There's a lot of cool stuff around what he said, because he's always had a more neutral approach to COVID since definitely. the beginning. And yeah. I've always appreciated Dr. Oz do that too, because people have tried to politicize this virus so much that having somebody who's taking a realistic a- aspect of it and saying, no, look at the data and act how you would act. The people who are at risk the most are going to be the ones who know their body well enough to know, hey, is this a risk I'm willing to take? Mm-hmm. So I think that you know it's important that the vaccine goes to the higher risk people who have done enough research to say, this is something I'm willing to risk with the unknowns to protect myself from this because I'm at high risk. And then with Bill Gates, business, Kevin, you always say business is anticipation, right? 
And a lot of the conspiracy theories come from people who make it seem like somebody knows the future because they know something they don't. But really, you can see that there's an yeah. issue and you can anticipate it and you can that's start right. making moves that whether you're profiting off it or not, you just that's kind watch. of what Bill Gates has done for the past five years. Mm -hmm. And it's not that he's evil or doing anything. It's that he anticipated this and he made moves yeah. to monetize to a certain degree, but also prepare himself to be in a position to be better off when this happens. I, and I ho I'd like to think that, you know, we've seen with other billionaires and over time, if you study Rockefeller and all the other ones, they kind of hit the end of their lives where they realize like they have so much money, then, then they become altruistic. If you study Maria, like, you know, Vanderbilt, all of them at the end of their lives, it became like a competition for those guys. I'm going to give away more than you. And I'd like to think that that's where Gates is at now, too. It's like, what's mm -hmm. the greater good? I mean, he came out, what, like 10 years ago, said his kids, they're going to just get a, a modest inheritance, but the rest is being donated. donated. Oh, they're donating yeah. it all yeah. to yeah. charity. Yeah. I mean, so, uh -huh. but you know what I, what, what I really, Dr. Oz, I think he also didn't minimize the psychological ramifications of us getting, yep. the positive psychological ramifications of us getting the vaccine. Mm -hmm. I think he was trying to say that as well, that we have to take that into consideration. Is the fact that, if mean, every, yeah. if you know, if everyone d vaccinates, we can feel better, we can have more confidence, we can maybe go out, we can live, we can boost the economy. Well, Kevin and I were cheering over here. We're like, we're ready. Yeah, let's go. Let's do it. Well, I mean, I'm kind of a lemming like that. I'm like, I'm, I'm in. And then, then that, your next guest will come on and say not to. I'll go, yeah, I'm not kidding. All right, guys, one. we got to get to some of our other chat okay, topics okay, that okay. we promised because I got to keep this train on track. We promised our favorite shows right now. For anybody who's looking for new viewing, I don't know if that was shared with Steven beforehand, but hopefully you can think of some ahead of time. Um, we did watch a really funny movie, I will add to this, um, this weekend from David Spade and Happy Madison. What was the name of it's the movie? It's called The Other Missy. The Other Missy. It's phenomenal. Guys. I love David. If you want to laugh. <laughs> just laugh, yeah. If you just want to laugh, this movie is epic. Um I had my hands covering my mouth most of the time, screaming out loud because I literally couldn't believe what I was seeing and what was happening. Steven, have you seen this movie? It's The Wrong Missy. I'm so sorry. The Wrong Missy. The I haven't yet. Steven? I, it's on my list. You're going to thank me. You're <laughs> going to love will. this. I don't know No, of will. course he will. I don't think No, I'll thank you in my mind, but I'll never vocalize it to you. Yeah. Okay. Oh I know. Steven's a tough, he's a tough cookie. It's He's just a tough so critic. Freaking but if you cuz he'll look at it like a movie. If you just look at it like, you know, not enough laughter in my life. Yeah. And if I can get one big laugh um, in 2 hours, but you there were several. And I think that's how Adam writes and I'm glad that Netflix gives him a platform yeah. just to go and like make those kind of fun movies that just make you laugh all the way through. I love Happy Madison. It's it's mindless greatness. That's what yes. it was. It's everything. That's what it was. And David it. Spade okay. is just Pure magic in it. He's so good. Yes, he Joe is. Dirt. I love Joe TV dirt. shows, guys. <laughs> I realized I promised we were going to talk about radical remission, and we didn't get to it yet. And I don't think we're going to be able to get to it. So let's get to favorite TV shows. Go around the room. Who wants to start? Kevin. I mean, Search Party, Maria on HBO Max. Yeah, this, I'm devastated it's, without it right now. It's been on multiple it. seasons, but it's one of those ones like Shit's Creek. It took a while to catch on. If you want something that's really funny, really wrong. Um, Really exemplary of people today and what's going on, and particularly the millennial culture. It's a pretty brilliant thing. And uh, yeah, I recommend get HBO Max and, and, and binge on it. I, I haven't had one person say to me anything but thank you. It's for so the good. Jeff yeah. Graham gave us that show. The Boys on Hulu. If you have not seen The Boys, Amazon Prime. Amazon. Is it Amazon Prime? Yes, honey. It's Amazon. I yeah, that's their crown jewel. Oh my lord, hmm? this is an amazing show. I think it's like the Breaking Bad of like. I think it's the best show. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's the. I think it's you, that you know, Succession. I think it's I mean, a little bit just a it's hair better, better than Succession because too. Succession's incredible. I think that's about a hair better. It's so good. I think it's the best thing. Yeah, the boys, check it out. And don't and please, if you when you see that it's superheroes and stuff, and you're one of those people who says, "Oh no, I'm not in the super," I get it. Trust me, this is not a superhero show. Yes. This is this is more about mm -hmm. a pop culture and the narcissism and the insanity we all live in. And the superheroes are just a metaphor. They're just an, just a, a way in. Just it's trust us. So good. Great. Emory is on it too, second season. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Kelsey? I got to go search party. I mean, I yeah. haven't had a chance to watch much, but I did watch that with you guys. And oh my God, everything Kevin said. But then also it's so witty. Like it's so 
mm-hmm. clever. It, I, I, I love it, it so much. And like the little subtleties too. Kevin and I will be like, did you notice this? Did you notice that? Yep. You guys, it's so good. And they're fast. I love when episodes are like 30 minutes long because you feel like you can yeah. you can watch it. Do we know if like shows like Barry are coming back? Like I love yeah, of Barry. Be back. I don't know. Of but course. I don't know. Well, Maria, there's been production issues, but they'll, they'll figure it out. Yeah. Of okay. course. But also I'm a Schitt's Creek stan until I die, so... That's my favorite. If you haven't watched it, it's Greek's great too. Um, my guilty pleasures lately have been Korean dramas on Netflix because they just uploaded like eight of them to Netflix. Well, they're in dramas. Well, no, they're exploding, Maria. K-pop. No it's a oh, yeah. it's a giant world. I was like, um, that was random. <laughs> yeah, I would also say for a documentary, The Lady in the Dale. Can you imagine if like Kelsey's like in Greek dramas? I'm like, why is she watching Greek dramas? <laughs> well, we've been watching we've been Greek watching TV shows him, here. It's been funny, like the vintage mom. ones. Yeah, mm. Lady in the Dale is a documentary about yeah, a trans. The Duplass brothers did. Yes, mm. it's a, it's incredible. It's really compelling and interesting, and uh, I loved it. I really did. It was beautiful. So everybody, since we didn't get to Radical Remission today... We are going to get to it tomorrow. Um, I think that hope and miracles are two things that people need more of and and the belief in them. And um, I was revisiting the book Radical Remission by Kelly Turner and re-inspired by the fact that she set out to study all of the people who had been told they had terminal cancer. And this was, you know, they were in their final months and then they had a complete radical remission and now they're living years later. And I think these are things that, I mean, I really feel like it should be assigned reading when you get diagnosed with something like doctors should give you this. Um, And so I want to, I want to talk about that and the things that she found that were the common threads, there were nine or 10 things that every person had done, whether it was like radically changing their diet or spiritual stuff or whatever, we'll go through all of it. But I'm feeling like that with my mom right now, because I'm looking at where my mom was two weeks ago, let's say. A week ago, even. Even a week ago. And, you know, doctors saying she was in kidney failure, organ failure. This is it. Um, We were giving her morphine. She was you know, and she was needing it. I was only giving it when she needed it. And then oxygen and all the stuff into now. I mean, she's a completely different person. She's laughing. Speaking in complete sentences, laughing. Like, uh, it's a completely different scenario. It's crazy. And what's the difference? Mm -hmm. We shifted all of our energy in this house into believing, into miracles, energy work, um, All the systems are flowing well now. We don't have any issues. I don't need to keep doing energy work on her bladder or anything. Like, everything's working. And so, um, I think, I think it's just important to share it. And, and we did that, like, you know, heel session that uh, Stephen's going to be editing or is editing. So, Stephen will share with us just, like, a clip of the heel session that we did with my mom with um, some of the amazing healers. But, it's really been an incredible turnaround. So we'll talk all about radical remission on tomorrow's episode. Join us. In the meantime, um, if you want to check out Dr. Oz's Good Life 18 products to help America start sleeping better, it's available in select Macy's stores and at Macy's.com. The full product assortment is available at DrOzSleep.com. Uh, Of course, the Dr. Oz Show airs at 1 p.m. Eastern Time in New York City, 2 p.m. Eastern Time in Washington, D.C., 1 p.m. Pacific, and 5 p.m. Pacific in L.A. To find the exact Dr. Oz Show time in your area, you can just go to their website, DrOz.com, and then click on where to watch Dr. Oz. And uh, that is it for us. If you haven't joined us on uh, Patreon, please click the link tree and Better Together with Maria or my Instagram for uh, ad-free shows, extra shows, and of course, exclusive access to our healing workshops. You can follow us at Dr. Underscore Oz, at Better Together with Maria, at Kelsmeyer2, at Stephen Lemieux Photo. And remember, be nice people, make good choices, and be present.